Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time to tune into The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block. Today we have, joining us on the other side of the mic for the first time, we're thrilled to have Kane Warwick. One of the crypto's true, true innovators, um, if you're not familiar with his entrepreneurial journey, he's obviously made waves in the DeFi economy as the mastermind, I guess we can call it, behind synthetics. Um, you, you probably are, uh, I don't know, gleeful or maybe annoyed that people have been so late to the real world asset party, um, but everybody's here now. Uh, you've been there for a while. And now you're sort of leading up this new venture uh, outfit, I guess we can say. And we'll get into all that, but Let's just kick things off with uh, basics. I, I was going through your Twitter before we turned on the mics, and you you had a you had a pretty kick-ass thread a few weeks ago about the state of venture that I definitely want to get into. Um, want to get into the extent to which VCs are left curve or right curve, but maybe for listeners who aren't familiar with your story, uh, just give us the TLDR. Yeah, so uh, I was I came from an online retail background um, and, a, and a payments background, so. Um, uh, I was interested in payments for a long time. I, I worked at a startup in uh, the early 2000s, uh, like right around the end of the first dot-com boom. And, you know, for the next kind of, I don't know, 15 years or whatever, I, I always sort of lamented the fact that I was just a little bit too young to kind of get in there at the right time. And uh, and so, you know, when I stumbled upon crypto, uh, I was like, all right, this feels like something that's quite interesting. Again, from the payment side that was that was really my angle um online payments and um you know at that time i was a uh, bitcoin maxi and thought you know bitcoin could be used for payments etc um obviously we've realized that's not the case for reasons but um that that was really my my first uh kind of uh you know experience with crypto and and how i got into it and then i later built a payments platform that enabled uh people to deposit cash into crypto and, and we supported uh, a bunch of the brokerages and exchanges in Australia. Um, that started in 2014. And then in 2016, 2017, I, I got into the ETH community. I let go of my Bitcoin maximalism and, uh, and jumped into the ETH community and, and saw the opportunity there um, you know, around smart contracts. And, and that was what led me to building Haven, which eventually evolved into synthetics. Nice. And so... Give us sort of um, an overview of what Synthetics has been up to um, over the past few years. Yeah, so you know, we we basically built this platform uh, initially as a stablecoin, and um, in 2018 there were no regulated stablecoins, or even you know, uh, I guess what you would call um, you know something like uh, Circles, USDC, um, you know, Paxos. They hadn't launched yet. Uh, so this was the age of basis. Yes, people remember exactly. Yeah, so that, yeah, there was, that phenomenal wind down that yeah. happened back in 2018. Yeah, so so basis, you know, had uh, had raised a bunch of money. Um, we were in the process of, of raising money, but no one had really launched. Even Dai hadn't launched yet. Um, and so, looking around, there was Tether. Obviously, and Tether had been around for a while, but Tether was very centralized. And so there was this idea of like building a decentralized stablecoin. And so that's what we set up to do with Haven. And by mid-2018, the bear market was setting in and we had seen the launch of like multiple different, uh, again, regulated is a strong word, but like, um, you know, uh, stable coins that were attempting to be more compliant, let's call it, right? Um, and so, you know, Paxos, TrueUSD, Circle, you know, launching USCC, et cetera. And we saw the writing on the wall and we we're like, this is not we're not going to be able to compete with this. Uh, it's going to be hard to scale a decentralized stablecoin and compete with, you know, dollars on the blockchain where people are just putting money in a bank, essentially. And so we pivoted from Haven in late uh, 2018 into Synthetics. The idea being that we could basically allow people via oracles to get exposure to a range of different assets. And one of the first ones that we did was uh, BTC. And it was one of the first ways that you get exposure to Bitcoin on Ethereum, or at least the price of, of, uh, of Bitcoin. And so we had these tokenized representations of Bitcoin called SBTC, synthetic Bitcoin, um, that people could trade. And, you know, at the time, IDEX and, and some of the other DEX platforms were really excited about having Bitcoin quote pairs so they could compete with, you know, the finances of the world. And then how, what did that, I mean, we're in an interesting place now where it seems like we're entering a, a, a new phase where everyone, there's this phase of experimentation, probably you could say Coinbase doing oil and gold, 
Um, there's new entrants. Um, you have Pith trying to obviously uh, uh, support, uh, offer price feeds and a wide range of assets through, um, through oracles. So I guess sort of with that context and that backdrop, um, where does this all go? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question to take on, but if anyone can do it, I think it'd be you. It is. Uh, it's a big question to take on. And, you know, I think things like Athena um, are very representative of how much discovery there is still to be made, right? Um, you know, everyone understood the basis trade. We, we got it. You know, people have been talking about tokenizing it. It wasn't 100% clear how to do it, what the mechanism to, to use was. And Athena sort of turned up, you know, after um, Arthur Hayes wrote that article, um, uh, you know, I guess almost two years ago now, and said, this is actually a novel way to, to scale this, right? We have uh, funding being paid by DGENs who want to go along, uh, and we can siphon some of that off and, and pay it to stablecoin holders. But even as that was happening simultaneously with, as you say, you know, rates uh, rising for the first time in a long time, the first time in crypto history, really, right? Like, it, you know, we've been in a zero rates environment for the entirety of, of crypto history. So it's hard to extract any real world yield when there's no, you know, yield in the, in the real world to extract, right? And so all of a sudden Maker, um, you know, and, and uh, for what it's worth in, in 2018, Rune was talking about, you know, tokenizing real world assets and, and pulling yield from the real world. And I was a big skeptic. I was like, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure about this. And, and it turns out that actually, you know, in a, a rates environment that is higher, not, not a zero rates environment, it is actually quite easy to do that. And so makers done very well, you know, by positioning themselves in a, in a way that when rates did rise, they were, they had all of the infrastructure in place to start to extract some of that. Um, and, and pay it out to stablecoin holders. So we've seen a bunch of different things like this, um, you know, happen. And, and I guess the, the end result of all of this is it's sort of representative, I guess, of the maturity of crypto and the maturity of stablecoins, where stablecoins used to be, like Tether, was just there to hold money that you were waiting to trade into some token. That was its only purpose, right? It was just like dry powders. And it served that purpose very well. It did. It did. And, and, I, and, and you could argue, Kane, that, um, I mean, USCC, I'm not, I don't want to get off your train of thought, but it, it, there's an argument to be made that it unlocked or unleashed what was DeFi summer. Had it not been for USCC, we might not have had that. And to, to a similar extent, had it not been for Tether, our capital markets in crypto probably would have continued to be super... Uh, nascent. Agreed. And, and I think this is the, the interesting thing, you know, Tether um, was sort of a, a portal to TradFi, if you will, right? Like a, a connection to TradFi, um, but it wasn't a great one, right? And then USDC was, was a better portal to TradFi, especially because it was an ERC-20 token. You know, people forget that Tether wasn't an ERC-20 token for uh, a long time. It was, it was on the Omni network. Um, and so it was really only centralized exchanges that can that could use it until they pivoted and, and launched in the ERC twenty. Uh, whereas, you know, as you say, USDC launched and allowed for all the dexes to suddenly have USD quote pairs for these things, right? Uh, but we've now reached, I would say, a level of maturity in the ecosystem where there are people who have tokenized dollars who are not just sitting there waiting to YOLO into a 20x leverage BTC position, right? Like they, they're holding them for other reasons, for, you know, a store of value reason. And if you're holding tokenized dollars, you want to get some yield on it. You don't want to just sit there idle, right? And so I think we've kind of hit this perfect point where, um, you know, there's a lot of money sitting on the blockchain that's not just for trading. It's, it's actually there for, um, you know, treasury management, all kinds of things. And, and you know, now there's, there are ways to get yield out of that. Um, so I think that this has been, you know, an evolution uh, that's been going on for, you know, six, seven, eight years now. And, and we're starting to see, um, you know, all of these different ways that it's playing out. Yeah, I think that's really well said. Why do you think, do, do, to what extent is the stable coin evolution story tied to, um, and, that, and that story obviously being underpinned by uh, this trans, transition that you're describing away from, Leveraging them as these idle assets is something that can can sort of um, sort of uh, 
yield more um, can yield more yield. <laughs> uh, how did we go? How 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 much of that story is tied to RWA's becoming um, having a moment right now, as it were? Uh, so whether it be uh, Biddle or just all the chat around, um, you know, assets on chain, how much are those two stories connected? People have been talking about tokenizing real world assets, you know, for a long time. One of the first use, use cases that got me excited about crypto was uh, tokenized equities. As someone who had been in the startup world, um, you know, uh, especially running private companies with private equity that had no liquidity, to me, I was like, okay, this seems like a pretty um, cool use case to be able to tokenize equity. It turns out that it was better to just throw away the equity and replace it with tokens. <laughs> that was a much more efficient approach to the problem. Um, you know, and, and so tokenized equity, I think, will take a little bit longer. But I think there's been a, a desire to tokenize everything for a while in crypto. It just needed something that was, you know, simple enough. Right. Um, and, you know, treasury yield, I think, is simple enough for people to understand. They get where it comes from and, you know, it, it's fairly stable. And so once we had that use case, I think that did kick off this, you know, excitement around, oh, this is a real thing. You know, people want to see a tangible use case first. And so, um, you know, I think Maker has done a very good job of positioning themselves ready to kind of launch into that. And as soon as they did, everyone was like, oh, RWAs, that's a real thing now. And so, you know, as property. Itself. Yes. But, but is, has it become a real thing to the extent that that excitement around that specific use case will then bleed into you know, pork belly futures uh, represented in the form of a token or through sort of uh, synthetic uh, price um, prices via oracles uh, or, you know, oil or, uh, you know, anything you can think of. I guess it's, it's interesting. We've tried this before. So synthetics has tried this. We've tokenized mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, real world assets in a synthetic form. It's kind of like throwing spaghetti. Exactly. Yes. Um, and the reality yes. is that uh, there's actually not that much demand in, in the crypto space to trade oil. You know, we had tokenized oil for ages, right? And, and no one really wanted to trade it. So then why does Coinbase uh, make the decision to launch oil and gold? Because people... Um, I mean, Tether Tether launched gold years yeah, ago. No one, no one uses it. it. People... But why, why are they, but because why? It's, it's, is it it's just hopium. for fun? People, it doesn't feel like it's just for a fun. Bit. People like <laughs> hope that it's a real thing, right? And so we keep doing it over and over, hoping yeah. that like today will be the day where it catches on. And look, yeah. people like trading gold. Don't get me wrong. So like the thesis is pretty straightforward, right? People like trading gold. People like trading on chain. They should like trading gold on chain. Like, yeah. So like it should, it should follow logically from that. And yet, you know, there's different people trading gold to the ones who are trading uh, Pepe, right? That's so, the problem. I think so. Like, like the over, the, the overlap, right? And we, we I guess, put a finer point to it. The, the problem that has underpinned um, RWAs outside of stablecoin, stablecoin adjacent products, is that the overlap of of people who have, have who have even a MetaMask wallet, but will be a bit more granular, who have punted shit coins on Uniswap to people who have traded oil futures, is maybe twenty people. But I could yeah, be wrong. I, I, I I mean, no, it's it's you know, there's very little overlap. They're, they're two distinct cohorts of people. Um, that said, if if our thesis that trading on chain is better is correct, then over time, you know, those two groups will become overlaid, right? Um, and, and it will unlock it. In the same way that, you know, people had this theory that, that everyone wanted yield on chain and they didn't because they just wanted to trade assets, right? They were just trying to YOLO leverage long um, volatile assets. And then one day we woke up and actually there were people here who genuinely were holding stable coins for reasons and wanted yield. And then we were ready to give it to them. So, you know, it just takes time, I think, sometimes for these these use cases to actually kind of emerge and connect with the real world. We'll have my friend Keldora at Austrium join the program in a few weeks. Uh, I'll have her listen to this. I'm sure she'll lament at my at my bear, my bear bait or my bear trap that uh, I've sort of presented her here on on trading oil on chain. I'm sure it's more than 20, Kildora. Please don't, please don't <laughs> send hate mail. Okay, 
it's like it's like synthetics, right? Thirteen users. Um, <laughs> there's probably thirteen people that want to trade oil on chain. Yes. So we can all sort of we can all commiserate in the in the low number of people who want to do. I mean, there's probably only thirteen listeners of the scoop as well. Let's let's be honest. Um, okay. Let's transition to let's make a very sharp, hard transi- transition to VC land. What was the sort of um, what was behind your transition? Uh, obviously, just made a lot of money and need somewhere to deploy it, or was there something something else? Yeah, I mean, we started running, um, I guess, what you could call a prop fund, right? In 2019, there were opportunities that were popping up, and people saying, "Hey, do you want to invest in this?" And you know, this is deep in the bear market, right? Um, I think the graph was one of the first ones, right? Um, and so. I was like, okay, I don't have time to do this. There's a there's overhead, right? In in investing, sure. even writing angel checks, you've got you know, even if someone's leading the round, you still got to read something and send money around, and you know, this this. Yeah, like, it's kind of it's kind of annoying. It, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, but it's fun. It's fun and right? good so, ROI, right? Which I guess yeah. we'll get to in a second. Which is what we'll talk about in yeah. a second. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, I was like, okay, um, I need some help setting this up. And so there were a couple of people in synthetics who were like, yeah, I want to, you know, let's do this together. And so they sort of took on the the kind of overhead, and I was getting the deal flow, um, and that rolled through for a couple of years, and it got to the point where um, you know a lot of the synthetics people were ready to retire, basically. Um, and, um, you know, or move on to new things or, or whatever. And one of them was like, you know, can I take this pool of funds that we've been, you know, co-investing and, and doing angel investments um, into and actually turn it into a fund? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great, actually, because, you know, I think that um, we need to get more uh, sort of, uh, you know, sophisticated about how we're doing this, right? So like, yeah, let's let's actually do it. The other thing is as an angel, um, you're sort of capped out at how much you can get in terms of allocations um, versus a fund, right? And so, you know, if you pivot to being a fund, even if you're getting angel deal flow, it's easier to get larger allocations or, you know, you can build that up. So that was that was kind of the reasoning behind setting up Bodhi. Um, and, you know, Jordan, who runs Bodhi, who is the founder, um, was looking for something to do that he could put his name to and say, like, this is my thing. And so I was like, yeah, let's... I'm happy to support that. So that's that's where that came from. Um, but you know, my I guess my dissatisfaction with the overall incentives in in early stage uh, crypto investing started well before that. Like it, it, you know, that didn't highlight it. I'd, I'd been seeing it for a long time. You know, in angel rounds and KOR rounds and, and all of this stuff. This new magic word that has uh, I yeah I, now, I, now I, you know what, now you know what it means right I know uh, Larry messaged me after I tweeted that and he was like how do you <laughs> he goes this word's been around for two years how do you <laughs> that's my Larry that's my that's my Larry impression uh, I'm gonna get fired <laughs> no but he was like I, yeah I was like I just I knew it like conceptually I knew what a KOL was I just never knew what it stood for what it stood for yeah exactly. um, we've had a, a number of episodes recently Kane where we sort of have dissected and unpacked the state of venture obviously the the sort of uh, what deal flow looks like um, you know the extent to which early stages may be crowded the quality of early stage deals. We haven't necessarily touched on sort of uh, some of your lamentations um, that that you're sort of hinting at, which are the bugaboos that um, you know. I, I guess we have to a certain extent, but but I was talking with a found or a, a venture firm a few weeks ago, and uh, we were kind of laughing because uh, uh, she was complaining that you know the 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 old mantra or meme of you know, dumping on retail is is not the case anymore. Uh, if anything, retail, because they get to play in the secondary market, have way more opportunities, are making way more money while the VCs, you know, are sitting on their hands with four-year, three-year lockups uh, on the early stage deals they got in. And, and you know, we should feel sorry for them. Uh, I, I appreciated your tweet where you, you said, you know, any, any uh, let me pull it up. Um, yes, anyone who says investing in seed rounds any, anyone investing in seed rounds who tells you it's hard, simply lying to themselves, it's pure cope. Um, it, it, is it is it hard? Is it is it, it should we feel sorry for these VCs that uh, you know have to struggle to elbow their way into these deals, or 
Um, should we feel sorry not. for the retails who? <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, but, but 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 to add to what you said, C deals. Um, there's not a single credible project where you see a TGE price below fifty million. Exactly. And and the and the point I think you you make here is that, okay, at the end of the day, you're getting access to very cheap, credible deals that retail would never get access to at that price. Unless it's like a Solana meme coin like Geo Bowden or something. And this is the thing, right? Like, I think, you know, meme coins are the market satisfying uh, a demand and, and fixing an inefficiency that exists in capital formation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fine. Like, that's, that's how the market works, right? The market will solve something if, if there's something broken, right? Um, and so I think meme coins are indicative of the broken incentives in early stage, uh, you know, investing, the challenge with, I mean, they're, they're fun. So what, but yeah, yeah, they are. Well, what's broken about it, Kane? So let's break down that first and then we can talk about how meme coins have become a manifestation of that brokenness. But, but what's, what's so broken? I think that when, when you look at traditional venture, right, there's an expectation. Um, and if you go back, you know, a long time ago, right? Like to late nineties, early two thousands, right? Um, I think the, the median uh, time to IPO was like three years, right? And over the last two decades, it's lengthened and lengthened, right? Um, you know, it, it's blown out to 10 plus years now, something like that. I think that's the, the latest stat that I read. Um, you know, so it's gone up three X, right? The, the length of time between uh, a venture starting and an IPO. And so this is not something that's like uh, unique to crypto. I think that it's it's happening across the board and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about this. Matt Levine talks about it all the time around, you know, private markets and the new public markets. There's ways to get liquidity. There's, you know, um, there's all kinds of reasons to stay private longer, um, especially because there's so much money in the private markets that there, there you know, wasn't. Uh, in the late 90s, let's say, in early 2000s. So, okay, fine. Um, you now have a situation where crypto has said, well, we can actually speed run IPOs, like three years, how about three months, right? And so, you know, ICOs were, uh, some venture starts and the TG happens three months later. And that, uh, that I guess, liquidity uh, benefit that, that you have, right, means that ICO prices were fairly compressed. And, and I think Kobe did a really good job of breaking this down um, in his article recently. And I, I kind of uh, had it in my tweet as well. This idea that, you know, the delta between the lowest price in a pre, you know, seed round or seed round before an ICO was typically like, you know, 50% discount or 60% discount, maybe. Um, and so, you know, you look at Solana, Ethereum, et cetera, um, you know, how they traded on market versus how they traded pre-TGE was pretty similar. Right. Um, you know, uh, certainly not 100x. And so then what we've seen is as ICOs were sort of crushed, right? And, and you know, uh, we went to this private capital market uh, structure that's more like traditional venture. Um, the, the delta between the pre TGE prices and TGE, uh, TGE prices got larger and larger and larger. Uh, for two reasons. Um, one, there was a longer amount of time, right? And so there is absolutely a, a discount that needs to be applied for being early to something when you're not going to get liquidity for three or four years, for sure, right? Like, I think that's a natural thing. If, if I'm investing in Frank Co. today and not expecting liquidity for five years, a lot of bad things could happen to you yeah. in the next five years, right? I could have another gallbladder attack. Yeah, like, but if if I'm investing in in you know the the Frank ICO and you're going to TG in five days, you're probably going to make that. Like, I'm not that worried. I think you'll make it to next week, right? And so I'm going to have liquidity straight away. And so you know I shouldn't really get much of a discount there. So as we pushed out the the um, time between founding a project and TG, um, discounts have increased. But then we've also had some other things creep in, which is that the TGE, the only way that you're getting tokens into the hands of retailers by giving them away for free, which is a very inefficient mechanism, right? 
It's like if you had, you know, an IPO, but you couldn't actually sell tokens to people on the exchange, yet sell equity to people on the exchange. You had to give it away to your customers. Like it's crazy, right? In order to actually get enough alignment, you've got to give away 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 percent of, uh, of, you know, the float um, to actually get even 3 percent of people that are aligned. Right. And we've seen, right, Kane, that this sort of the, the customer acquisition or customer acquisition cost of that is, um, I mean, it's it's enormous and it doesn't create sticky users. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, so, you know, so you imagine you've got a thousand people in a discord, right, who, who uh, are excited about a project. Instead of those people being able to get exposure to the project at the time when they find out about it, they're excluded from getting access. They have to wait to, till there's a TGE hope that the airdrop uh, goes to them, right? And oftentimes it won't because it will be gamed and it'll go to mercenary airdrop farmers or, or whoever. And so you end up, you know, at the end of a year or 18 months, these very aligned thousand people that were in the Discord originally have very little exposure to the project. And that's just not efficient. But the worst part about it is, and this is the, the key thing, is you end up with the only unlocked tokens being the ones that you gave away for free. And so if you only give away 10% of the tokens, you have, you know, uh, a demand for the token that is artificially inflated by not being satisfied. There's a bunch of people who want to buy the token and you've refused to sell it to them. You said, no, I can't sell it to you. I can only give it away to a bunch of random people, buy it from them. Right. <laughs> but I can only give away 20%. Like, and now you're in this situation where it's like, okay, buy it from the people that farmed you mercilessly for the last you know, three months or whatever. Um, and you just end up in a situation where, where demand and supply do not meet, right? Um, and, and you have these inflated uh, FDVs that are just not representative of, of where the, the project should be, you know, things trading up to 5 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion, et cetera. And, and if you had done the same thing with an ICO, they just wouldn't trade up that high because you'd have 40%, 50%, 60% of the float out there. And supply and demand would find a much more natural equilibrium. There'd be better price discovery and you wouldn't have this artificial demand just driving up, uh, you know, the, the token price. And so all of these things, the lack of liquidity, the longer time between founding and TGE, not actually selling tokens in the TGE, only giving them away, all of that stuff combines to, to create a very perverse set of incentives that, uh, that you know, end up hurting the people that are you know trying to support the project right like retail retail holders who want to support the project well kane there were several folks who had either joined this program or with whom i've had conversations that described the panacea of these of 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 our of our woes in in the secondary market and airdrops as being points i thought points was supposed to fix all this because they give us a, a mechanism by which we can gauge interests. We can weed out the the mercenaries and, and protect the missionaries by giving them a dashboard they can look at to see how many points they've acquired. Um, and yet we see the debut of Frentech as almost, I don't know, throwing quite a lot of cold water on that argument now. It's a leading question, but... No, no, no. I think there's two sides to this, right? So Frentech said... Okay, you know, points uh, and and this kind of low float thing don't make sense, right? On some level, um, and so instead of giving out a bunch of points and then converting those points to three percent of the supply, what if we convert them to a hundred percent of the supply? Like that is a solution, right? Um, it's not the best solution, but it is definitely a solution that I think Frentech had a better chance of pulling off than most because the people who earn points were kind of, you know, semi doxed in the sense of like, you'd connected your Twitter account. And so you sort of knew who they were and who had earned them. And, and I, I think if you squint, you could say, well, okay, fine. Like it's getting into the hands of the right people who are using the product. Of course, there were people farming it, but it wasn't as bad as some campaigns. Sure. No, I think, I mean, I think it should, it, it, it definitely on paper made a lot of sense in the execution, but it didn't translate into rope of, robust, stable pricing at launch. 
I mean, what you get is price discovery, right? For sure. But at what cost? And this is where I say they, they went to the extreme of if you have to give away 100% of the supply to get price discovery, you're going to have an artificially depressed price in the same way that you'll have an artificially inflated price if only 3% of the tokens are, are circulating. So there's some middle ground here, right? Like Frentech is the other end of, of the spectrum, the extreme end of the spectrum. Um, and, and it's super inefficient. Right. Like we've seen this before. Wi-Fi is a great example. Wi-Fi did this. Right. It was a fair launch. Everyone farmed it. You know, people dumped, people held, whatever. Um, and then two years later, there's no tokens for the people who are building the thing. And they had to put a governance proposal in to actually give themselves more tokens to get alignment because they gave all the tokens away. Like, you know, we're going to speed run that and, and friend tech's going to realize that actually we need you know, I mean, obviously, there's a few people in, in the team who were early friend tech people who got a big airdrop, but I don't think it's going to be enough to keep the alignment. Um, now, there's equity and there's other stuff. And, you know, but at the end of the day, if the token is the thing that aligns people, uh, the team will need tokens, in my opinion, to, to keep that alignment going longer term. And you've given away all the tokens. So now what do you do? How would you describe when the high golden age of angel seed deals in crypto, has it been since the Ethereum ICO to is it still ongoing? Um, I, you know, there's one one of my colleagues at the block always says, you know, oh, you know, it, 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 if if you had done a bunch of angel deals in the last cycle, you'd be set. This cycle, it's too late. But I think you disagree. I think you'd say we're still in the high golden age, and and if that's the contention. How long does it end? When is the man in the meme with the 7% return talking to the man in the meme with the 15,000% return saying that just wait till the music stops? When is the music going to stop? <clears throat> I, I don't think it does with the current structure, right? And this is where regulatory uncertainty uh, is, I think, the, the main driver of these inefficiencies in the market, right? You know, as I said, if you do an IPO, there's a, there's a path. To doing an IPO, right? You launch a company, you grow it for five years. Of course, there's early investors. They take a lot of risk. Um, they, you know, they have no liquidity for the first five years, and then in an IPO, they get some liquidity, and then you know, over the next two years, they sell out and, and rotate out. ICOs were that, right? Like ICOs were that mechanism, just compressed down into like a three, six month period, right? Instead of a five year period. There's no mechanism to do that right now. Um, and that's the problem. If, if there were a mechanism to allow a team to build a project, you know, raise early stage funding, I don't think there's a, a huge issue with a project raising at a 30 mil FTV and then a 300 mil FTV and then IPOing at a 600 mil FTV, let's say. Um, that's fine, right? Where it gets problematic is when it goes 30, 300, 300 billion. <laughs> like, that's just ludicrous, right? Like, it's not, and, and you know, you can say, oh, FTV is a meme and people should ignore it. And I was just going to ask, to what extent is this something that we shouldn't be paying that much attention to? I mean, at the end of the day, what, what happens, right, is you have a thing that is, you know, now has a $300 billion fully diluted valuation, which means in order for the price to be stable, it needs to grow into that valuation over the course of however long the unlocks are, right? So let's assume the unlocks are over three years, right? So in, in the course of three years, there's going to be 95% more supply on the market, right? And so you're going to need 95% more demand to come in over that three-year period to keep the price stable. So anyone who's buying that token on day one at a 300 bill FDV, it, it's just obvious. It's the inverse of buying the seed round, right? Like if you buy the seed round of the 30 mil uh, FTV, well, look, the thing at 300 billion on TGE day, right? Does it go down to 30 mil? No, right? Does it go down to a billion? Maybe, right? That's a 99.999% drawdown, right? Uh, but you actually don't care because, you know, if it's at, you, that's still a 2X for you or a 3X or a 5X or, or whatever as a seed round. Participant. So the, the issue is 
getting price discovery right at the time that the token becomes available for everyone to trade. And in order to do that, you need more supply. And that's the thing that we need to fix, right? We need a way to do that. Now, I'm skeptical of, of regulators stepping up and solving this for us in the short term. Um, I think that it, it needs to be solved by the market. And I think the market is trying to find ways to solve this. But, um, you know, it, it's it's something that there needs to be experimentation to fix this because it's a broken system as it stands. Well, let's ideate. What what are some potential fixes that can uh, uh, ameliorate this situation? I think there's a bunch. And, you know, this is where Kobe is quite uh, funny, right? Because like, there's a bunch yeah. of things you can do and they're all illegal. Right now, you know, that's a bit hyperbolic, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if they're strictly all illegal, um, all of the things that you could try. Um, but certainly you're in a very uh, gray area from a regulatory perspective, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, depending on who's involved, depending on how you set it up and structuring. And, you know, that level of uncertainty is, is not ideal. Now, in the IPO market, there's a bunch of exchanges around the world, right? You can IPO on the NASDAQ or, you know, you can... IPO uh, on the ASX, right? Now, mm -hmm. the NASDAQ has a lot. I've been there. Yeah. Before. Yeah. So, you know, the ASX is the Australian stock. Right across from the statue of Queen Victoria. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one has a lot more liquidity than the other. Let's just put it that way. Right. And so, you know, That's for all sure. things being equal, you'd rather uh, IPO on the NASDAQ. But ultimately, these exchanges are kind of gatekeepers. Right. Um, you know, and, and they're not regulated bodies. They just operate within a regulatory framework, but they sort of gatekeep who can uh, mm -hmm. who can list and how much liquidity they can get. Sure. And there are rules to that sort of on maintaining your listing status. If you, I mean, <laughs> ironically enough, BACT is facing a delisting given its um, its stock price falling below, I think, $1 or something to that effect. But yeah, there are all these different parameters that, that keep a company in good standing to to maintain their listing status and and disclosure we don't have that in crypto yeah we don't. And there's no structure right like so you know there's this there's trade there's a trade there right um and you know one of the interesting things in in the ipo market in the, in the equity market is there is a thesis that the reason why uh liquidity is delayed and ipos are delayed is because the level of scrutiny of being listed is significantly higher, right? It's become much more owner. It's also expensive. It's expensive. It's, you know, there's a lot of overhead, right? It costs, um, you know, I think something, I, you know, millions to tens of millions of dollars a year to be a, a listed entity on, you know, most regulated stock exchanges. Um, and so if you're not making millions to tens of millions of dollars of, uh, you know, um, net revenue or profit, then, it, that's going to not be uh, a good scenario for you for you to do. So um, again, it's it's like we need a mechanism for people to be able to buy tokens. And when the theory right now is that every single token is a security, including Geo Bowden, right? Um, that's just not sane, right? Um, and and you know, my view is that we we kind of in the last probably two years, I would say, shifted from this perspective of we just need to educate regulators and legislators like we need to they don't quite get it i think we've shifted and and i think they get it they just don't like it and that's a very different environment to be playing in right you're now in an adversarial environment where it's like we disagree in principle that this thing should exist and we're going to try and shut it down now it's not working out that well for them right now um i think we kind of have them on the run um but you know until we have more clarity and some sane um you know uh, rules and and um you know clear guidelines of, of what can be done the market will continue to be inefficient mm. we need some guardrails i wonder if there's something that the exchanges can do to mimic or mimic to some extent the structure of, of U.S. equity markets to, to some degree, some some form that doesn't, some some model that doesn't get them too, too much in the ire of the regulators. Well, this is the problem, right? Like there's a, there's a very uh, perverse incentive to err away from that. As soon as you say, well, what if we were to do disclosures and make them look, then they're like, yes, exactly. Now we've got you, right? So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, and also like what, what is a disclosure from a DAO, right? Like a generally, you know, like a, a, an organization that has decentralized maker DAO, 
right? Um, you know, they got rid of their foundation. They used to have a foundation. You could say, well, okay, there's a like incorporated foundation that could do the disclosures, right? That, you know, you could point to and say, they're maybe not in charge of every decision, but certainly authorized to make disclosures about the decisions that have been made. That doesn't even exist sure. anymore. Maker doesn't have an entity, right? They got rid of all of them like Synthetics did many years ago. And so who is authorized on behalf of the Maker DAO to make a disclosure to people? Yeah. Like it's a good, it's, I mean, we could have a whole uh, conversation on, on this or, you know, this is actually an interesting topic. Someone should do some research or write a story on this. I'm going to flag because it's so it brings back my old world, um, you know, for, journalism. I worked at NASDAQ doing corporate communications. And so I often think about the parallels between these two universes um, in this in this exact way. Okay, Kane, maybe, uh, maybe we can just do a, a few minutes of, uh, you know, for listeners who follow you or know you for your sagic wisdom on, on all things early stage and angel investing. Maybe we just give some practical advice for folks who are going at this. Maybe they've done five deals, 10 deals, or Zed, zero. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think you can sort of share with them to help, help them sort of, uh, you know, the do's and don'ts as it were. We talked about how the, at, at a macro level, everything's kind of messed up, but I'm sure at a micro level, there's probably some I issues that you can help people uh, overcome. I think the fundamental thing is deal flow. And this is where, you know, there's this sort of uh, a two tiered system, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who have good deal flow. You either have flow or you don't, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so this is where I say, you know, most of the people who are, you know, LARPing as investing geniuses going into, you know, angel rounds and KOL rounds, right? Um, they have good deal flow. Right. They're like, no, no, like this is, you know, I'm choosing between, you know, this thing that's going to be a 30 mil FDV and, and, you know, like it's, it's actually not that hard if you have reasonably good deal flow, right? There, there's a lot of toxic flow out there. And so if you're an average person who doesn't have good deal flow, it's very hard for you to get into the good deals. Okay. So what is, what are the red flags for toxic flow? What, what alarm should be rang? I think there's a there's a whole bunch of things, um, but probably the the best uh, indicator I would say, and this is this is a thing that you know takes a little bit of skill to develop. I, I would argue is uh, looking at the incentives and and the team, right? Um, you know, if you if you have a chance to speak to the founders and you can you know try and understand what their incentives are, like what what are they doing this for? Um, I think that that is probably one of the the main indicator right but again if you if you don't have good deal flow as in you know you're not someone who has um, already some level of you know notoriety or whatever in the space and, and are, you know like uh, in my twitter dms i get a lot of crazy deal flow as as you can imagine right you know people hitting me up all the time and 99 percent of it i ignore right um if if that were all of the deal flow that I had, yeah, then seed rounds would be hard for sure. Like if, if I only had those, but then I also get <laughs> handpicked deals where, you know, a friend of mine who's uh, a founder of, you know, a major DeFi project says, hey, I'm going into this deal and, you know, it's been vetted by Paradigm. What do you think? Do you want to write an angel check? Like, obviously, yes. Like, it would be crazy if I was like, mm, no, I think I'm, I think I'm going to mid curve. <laughs> I think I'm going to get back into my DMs. Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, there is very much a two track system here. Right. And so when I say it's easy, you know, to, to make money from seed rounds, if you've got the good deal flow, now someone could argue, well, that's a skill in itself, right. Just being um, in the right place. Right. Um, I'm not sure how credible that, that claim is. It feels again, a little <laughs> bit like hope, right. Um, you know, if you're a builder that built things, Okay, that one of the bonuses is you probably get good deal flow, right? Um, I don't know if that makes you a good investor though. It just means that you're a good builder that now has deal flow. Um, so as a as someone who doesn't have good deal flow, I think it's very hard, right? Um, because there's almost this adverse selection. If someone is trying to raise money from you and you know hand on heart that you 
do not have good deal flow and that, you know, there's no good reason this is this person is trying to raise money from you, then it's probably a red flag. Realistically, right? <laughs> uh, because otherwise they'd be going and raising money from, you know, whoever. Paradigm. Right? Paradigm. Exactly. Or me. <laughs> or you. Exactly. You know, or a bunch of angels or, or whatever. So, um, you know, it's it's a tough one, right? Because if you can get into the deals, then it's an obvious yes. If you can't get into the deals, then it's probably adverse selection, right? Some toxic flow. I was at a I was at a conference down in Washington D.C. Uh, with a colleague of mine, um, and a very large market making firm had a drinks event where all the brokers were um, uh, invited, basically. And a person comes up to me and said, "I, was, you know, my colleague and I were pretending like we had no idea what was going on," and she goes, you guys don't look like you belong here. And I go, yeah, what is, what is all this stuff? Is it like Wall Street <laughs> or something? And she goes, let me explain to you how this all works. She goes, look at this room. I go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, what's going on? She goes, we want flow. I go, what's flow? She goes, they have the flow, we want the flow. I go, how do you know if someone has flow? She goes, if you have flow, you know you have flow. And then my colleague goes, do I have flow? And she goes, you would know if you have flow. You probably don't have flow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. But um, anyway, amazing. we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for taking the time. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. That was yeah, really fun. that was a blast. We'll be back soon. Mm-hmm.